Professor Salim al Haq Dialogue. Join us on the Climate Channel South Asian Environment Dialogue pre COP analysis. The talk show will focus and provide insights into the upcoming UN Climate Change Conference in Dubai from November 30 to December 12, 2023. John Tabasu is discussing with prominent experts. Watch. Welcome to Destination COP28, Professor Salim Al Haq Dialogue. Uh, it's a dialogue being planned quite some time back when Professor Salim Al Haq, one of the frontline climate scientists and experts that we had with us, literally. But unfortunately, we lost him uh, in between. And then we thought on behalf of Climate TV channel, Canada, in the plurals that it may be a better way to respect him by, by naming this dialogue with Professor Salim al -Hawk. And also, I'm very thankful to ICAD, the organization that Professor Hawk has set up. Uh, they have very kindly agreed to be part of this. So there's a dialogue being also collaborated uh, by ICAD. Now, this dialogue proposes to look at COP28, how COP28 will unfold, propositely unfold. And we'll be talking to various experts uh, about specific issues. And I have such a joy to have one of the person I regard most on this agenda on the issue of environment and climate change, somebody who literally lives on the front, Professor Shumita Narayan, my very good friend, and, and, and I really respect him a lot. And uh, Sunita, uh, her health is, she is having a cough and all, but still, uh, she's game for today's interview. Sunita, thank you for being here. And it was such a joy uh, to have you as our, my first guest in this Destination COP28, uh, Professor Salim Al-Hawk Dialogue. And we plan to talk about specifically on the issues of carbon market and equity, but we'll be touched upon other issues. But before going into that, I know that you knew Salim al for a long time, any, any reflection on that? Yeah, Gento, I mean, I think it's such such a tragic loss for the world. And when you asked me to do this, I could not say no. Anything in the name of Salim, I cannot say no. And I I have known, I knew Salim Ulhaq for years. Uh, when he was first in Bangladesh, worked with Atiku Rahman. Uh, we grew up, I mean, Anil, uh, my uh, director, Anil Lagarwal, Salim Ulhak and Ati, good friends. I saw them. I saw the the way Salim Ulhak really took on the issue, which at that time we didn't really understand the issue of adaptation and uh, the issue then of the losses and the, 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 the commitment that he had to the whole issue of the loss and damage fund. I mean, I think this is a time when the world is so desperately uh, broken that we needed the same voice of Salim ul -Haq. And I do feel that it's a tragic loss. It's a loss for us, uh, for this region. But I think most importantly, he was a voice um, uh, which could persuade people across the world. And I think that's where I think we have really lost a champion. Absolutely. And we all saw, even in Sharm el Sheikh, how we played a stellar role in, mm -hmm. in obtaining that loss and damage finance facility after a prolonged, prolonged negotiation from civil society. I think all of you and uh, Professor Fogg played such a crucial role. But I think the better way to kind of remember mm -hmm. him to, 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 to go ahead, perhaps some of the things he spoke about, about the preparation of the loss and damage. Now, overall in climate context, let us come to the main discussion point of, of, this, of this destination COP28. Carbon market. Now, I was looking at the, the Sharm el Sheikh uh, implementation plan. I was looking at the finance and market is supposed to play a major role in it. Now, how you see that? I, I, I ask this uh, because uh, Sunita, sometime back, down to it, uh, I think did a very, very good, I think, almost path-breaking uh, story on, on, on market, voluntary carbon market, and actually said that it's such a shady market. I, if I can quote yeah. 
from your copy as the shady market, shady yeah. and secretive, if my memory is absolutely right. So, absolutely. Your point. No, thank you, Chento. Thank you for asking that. I Let me first place it in context and then tell you a little bit about our investigation. Firstly, why is it important? It's important because, like you very rightly said, markets is an agenda at COP28. Now, why is market an agenda at COP28? Because countries of the South are desperate today for financial, um, uh, for finances, both in terms of dealing with the loss and damages that they that they have, and their development, and also money for the energy transition they need to do. They do not have money. An earlier report of CSC showed very clearly how the bulk of the money coming in the name of climate finance was coming as loans, which meant that countries which are already indebted were further under debt, this time in the name of climate change and climate improvement. Now, this is the crisis of finance. And given the crisis of finance, countries are being preyed upon. And I'm using the word very, very carefully. They're literally being preyed upon by um, smart consultancy companies, industry, which are cre coming together and offering countries that, listen, if you plant trees, we will pay you some money. If you go and um, uh, distribute smokeless chulas, uh, we will pay you some money. Uh, so it has become a way of getting of them to basically uh, uh, go to countries and say that we will give you some money. And major right. deals are being signed where, you know, large areas of forest lands are being handed over uh, in large parts of Africa and other places. Now, it is in that context that CSC did this investigation, CSC down to earth. And the reason was that we wanted to understand what is the nature of what exists today is the voluntary carbon market. There is no regulated carbon market right now. That will come after the rules get finalized. The Paris rule book gets finalized. Right now, what is playing is a voluntary carbon market. So what is it doing? And Janto, I was honestly shocked. You know, firstly, I thought I was beyond being shocked. I mean, I've seen so much. But I was honestly shocked, the scale of the market in India, the fact that we had no idea, no government department knows that this market exists, how many projects are being signed, who is the project proponent, who is supposed to be the beneficiary, where are the carbon credits being sold, at what price are they being sold, there is absolutely no idea. And as we investigated, as you very correctly said, it was shady, it was secretive. The, the industry is told us that they cannot share anything with us. Then they told us we would have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Just imagine telling a journalist that we have to sign a non-disclosure agreement before they will tell us which village we can go to, okay? A French fund wrote to us saying, uh, which has a project in the Araku Valley in um, in um, um, in uh, the south of India. They wrote to us saying that, oh, it is too dangerous for you to go. The roads are very bad. This is insurgency area and you cannot go there. I mean, you're telling an Indian that we cannot go to our own villages? Okay, that's the but level. Araku Valley of... is a tourist spot. Araku Valley is a very good tourist spot. And then there was a company, the biggest company wrote to us saying they're in a period of silence. I mean, who writes an email like this, that they're in a period of silence and they cannot interact with us, they cannot give us data. And what we found was shocking. We found that there was an overestimation of the carbon credits. Now, that's particularly dangerous because the other side, which is buying the carbon credits, is assuming that there is something good happening, but it is not. Right. And as a result of it, you're overcrediting the carbon credits. That side continues to pollute. We are not seeing the benefit. So it's bad for the planet. We found that there was no benefit going down to the community. The community at best was getting a few crumbs in the name of the carbon market. In the Araku Valley, the tribals had been asked to sign away 
their right to the tree for 20 years by the Nandi Foundation through to the French company, food company. Now, on what basis is this happening? Okay, So they were getting no benefits from it. The entire benefit was being derived by the consultancy company, by the verifier, by the auditor, by the registry. And lastly, most importantly, Jato, which is of concern for all of us is, you follow climate negotiations very carefully. You know that we are no longer in the era of the Kyoto Protocol. In the Kyoto Protocol, certain countries had to take on commitments and the rest of the countries did not have any commitments, which means that when you had a clean development mechanism, you were basically trading credits from countries with no commitments to countries with commitments. Right. Okay. But now, under the Paris Agreement, we all have taken on a nationally determined contribution. We all have targets. Now, what therefore will happen to these um, deals that are happening under which offsets are taking place? India is Indian uh, renewable energy projects uh, have been offset against the miles of some employee of some company, somewhere, something. The point is, it is not going into our credit. So what's going to happen? And that's something that concerns us. I'm very happy to tell you that in many African countries are very put, uh, concerned about this. And many of them have come up with very good uh, statements. Is it a global trade? Is it a global trade? Uh, it's a global Jamaica? trade. It's a completely global trade, but India has a very large proportion of it. Something that I'm sure you did not know. Okay. We have 1,400 projects. Nabar Nabad was supposed to be the gatekeeper. Uh, so what's the role of Nabad uh, in this whole no, process? No, this is of... nothing. This is a voluntary um, um, trade. Mm. So this, so, when when, when I, they all government is telling us this is, there is no, uh, they'll have to come up with a rule to say, we will not allow export of credits or that you will have to register, that you will, right. they will have to say that nobody has. And as a result of it, these projects are happening. I know in Sundarbans, I know in Araku, right. some good projects as well, but there are issues in terms of knowing what is happening in India. What are the benefits flowing here? What is the price that we are selling the carbon for? And in whose credit will this go? That is the ultimate issue. The now, we can question. be very cynical and say it doesn't matter. India doesn't really care. But we should care. Absolutely. I think uh, absolutely. I think this is a very, very important and uh, I think crucial part of this whole market mechanism. But as you mentioned, I think not only India, it's a global trend. So what's happening in India may be a larger scale, maybe may, will perhaps happen somewhere else. Now, linking it to the global kind of uh, negotiation, we know that a couple of cops back, I think perhaps in either in Madrid, just before COVID or, or in Glasgow, there was an issue of market versus market. There's an old market, carbon market, that was on its way out. Now, India and few countries say that we have old certificates. What about those? And the developed countries saying, no, no way. Those certificates are not valid one. So not all these things. So how do you see this whole market dynamics go in, in, in COP28? You know, way out of all the market has resolved all that all the old CERs have been credited that's all happened forget all that uh, I think now Jayanto that old I mean you know in any case this whole Kyoto mindset we have it's all gone let's focus on the fact is so much is happening today why aren't we focusing on now instead of you know got some bandwagon wagon about you know you know Kyoto CERs what has happened to that right. those credits have actually been switched most, uh, if you look at most of the companies that we investigated, the CERs have been adjusted against the new credits that have been issued. So basically, the, the new market has to come up uh, under the Paris Paris Agreement structure. That's right. And now that is the big question, Janto, because what will be the rules of that market? Okay. Firstly, will a voluntary market, should it survive? And if a voluntary market survives, how does it conform to the country's NDC, um, a national determined contribution? 
Uh, how does it uh, conform to that? How is it in compliance with that? Um, there are two rules going to be discussed also at COP28, 6.2, 6.4. Which will discuss the bilateral markets as well as the global market. Now, global market. please understand there is dire urgency about this because, and if you, when you go, if you remember in Sharm el Sheikh, and if you remember, and this time I'm sure in Dubai, uh, countries are desperate for finances. So, carbon market is being seen as the one opportunity they have to get money. Because you must also understand, and the OECD report that came out just day before, which is now claiming that the world is reaching its 90 billion, uh, 100 billion target, it's reached 90 billion. Um, um, forget the methodology, I'm not getting into it. But there are two issues in that report that need to be understood. One, the report itself says that the bulk of the money coming uh, in the name of climate finance is coming from multilateral funds, not from bilateral, not from private. In fact, private funds are a very small proportion of the money that is coming in the name of climate finance. Most of it is multilateral and most of it is in loans. Mm. So there is nothing called climate finance. It is debt. It is additional debt that countries are getting. That's big. And that's Important. the big issue. And that is why climate markets are becoming the one way to unbundle the private sector money. Mm -hmm. And that is why our issue that if you unbundle the uh, private sector issue, it must come with very high integrity. In fact, uh, as you mentioned, that market is one of the one of the major instrument of kind of getting hold of money. And, and I was looking at the Sharm el Sheikh uh, uh, agreement and implementation plan. There itself, it mentioned about USD 4 trillion per year needs to be invested in renewable energy up until 2030 to be able to reach net zero emission by 2050. And also they talked about the 5.9 trillion, which has been reiterated during the G20 uh, meeting at Delhi. So with a such figure, previously we were talking billions, now we are talking trillions. How you see uh, planning from market to overall finance, how this finance issue, that's a key issue, Sunita, you keep on saying, is going to kind of unfold in, in, in COP28. So yesterday How we did a, you are about finance. So we did a very good webinar uh, looking at the whole issue of beyond climate finance. And one of the most wisest thing that was said by Rakesh Mohan, who you know is one of India's premier economists, he said, stop talking about the quantum of money because nobody understands trillions, nobody understands billions. So start putting down what it actually means in terms of projects, in terms of what is the money needed for, what you need to do. And I think that's where the money discussion, the money discussion has happened at two levels. One, at the level of understanding that we need concessional finance. Our report beyond climate finance brings out three facts, which are very important. One that there is no private money. It is multilateral money. Number two, that multilateral money is going as loans and not as grants. Number three, it is going to countries which have a very high debt ratio already, which means that what is coming in the name of climate finance is only adding to the debt burden. Number four, these countries are already spending a majority of their revenue, their government revenue in servicing their debt. Okay. Number five, that the cost of finance for these countries is very high because of the perceived risk, which means that if um, Europe gets a loan or even Greece gets a loan uh, for a renewable energy project at 3 to 5 percent. An African country will get it at 20 to 25 percent. India at 10 percent. Now that makes projects unviable. So climate finance must move beyond the talk about 100 billion, must look at the issues of finance from this lens. That is the first thing. The other thing that is very clear is that if you want private finance, you will have to make sure that it plays by the rules of the market. 
In Sharma, she also this spoke about the restructuring of the financial institutions That's in right. context of climate finance. So how you see on that? So I What's think on that? I think there's a lot of talk, and in fact, um, uh, my colleagues have just put together a list of all the meetings that have held this year on the re on reframing the climate, uh, the financial architecture. Uh, I think the good thing is, Chanto, is that we have moved beyond, that the conversation now is much more mature in these contexts. So they understand what needs to be done. But I think the bad thing is that we are still not moving the needle towards how do we reform that financial architecture so that it works for climate change. Well, Sunita, thanks for, I think, very important issues and pointers that you mentioned, I think these are the issues we'll be all following up in COP28. Finally, before I, 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 I leave you, is that overall, how you see this COP28, because it's really a, now, perhaps we keep on saying it for the last few years, but now I think somewhere, I think it's a, it's a, it has to happen. It has to happen. The climate uh, agendas need to be taken at the right perspective, especially in context of the series of recent reports, uh, emission gap report, the various reports very clearly show where we are standing right now. So how do you see, at this point of time, a few days down the line, we'll be having COP. Uh, how, what's your thought about how COP28 will pan out overall? Uh, so I think COP28 is a very important opportunity. It's happening in our region. Uh, yes, it's happening in an oil producing country, but that's also good in my view because it puts the onus on, it puts the spotlight. It also makes it, makes it much more pragmatic in terms of saying, how do we move ahead? Um, I also think that COP28 has a very important agenda called GST, Global Stock Take, which is kind of framing uh, the negotiations as we go on. Um, Loss and damage uh, fund needs to be operationalized. There's good news there that the transitional committee has come up with a draft, which is as good as we can get in today's context. And I think it is, I hope it doesn't get reopened and I hope we go through with it. Um, there is also going to be some money that is put in. EU has made a, a initial um, um statement saying they're going to put in money. I'm hoping that the EU has maturity and sagacity and they don't come up with conditionalities for that money because I'm also hearing rumors that EU will put in money if other countries take on emission reductions. So I hope it doesn't become another um, uh, unnecessary battle. I hope there is maturity right now because the world is really broken, Jento. And I think climate change is one opportunity to bring it together. And I hope that, um, I really hope that COP28 will succeed. I don't think any one of us should have expectations that we will change the world with this COP. But if we can take steps ahead and forward and not go backward, I think it's a very big thing in today's world. You expect that this recent war already, we, we are having a war for uh, a long time, and now another war is adding to it. Uh, do you see that sabotage part of the uh, kind of uh, road ahead we could have happened? Do you expect it to sabotage, especially the developed countries' point of view? Feel something they can show it as a, something of a thing to kind of not coughing up enough money? Well, let's see. I think everybody realizes the imperative of climate change. Everybody is hit by climate change. It's an issue that brings the world together. It also is an issue that divides the world. Now, that is the point <laughs> in terms of how we move ahead. Thank you, Sunita. It's such a pleasure and privilege always to speak with you. Uh, Professor Sunita Naran, Director General of Center for Science and Environment, one of the frontline uh, front uh, I would say, uh, think tank, not only in India and Asia, but now working a lot in Africa as well. So, Sunita, we look forward to keep on talking with you. I, I, I kind of note the pointers that were mentioned and we'll be all following it up. So, thank you and be well quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janta. Bye.